This is the story of Jean Gilbert, a married mother of three who lost her life due to a jealous, controlling and abusive husband. A marriage that lasted 10 years until finally ending in the brutal stabbing by her husband in front of their three children. I know I've basically given you all the totality of this murder in a couple of sentences, but as usual it's a complicated case of whether it was murder or manslaughter, whether her husband David was provoked or whether there was intent. Even though the jury decided on murder and David Burke sits in prison to this day, I would love to involve you all in the comments on your opinion of the case as you are all very good in that way. I will give you the facts and what was said by both Jean before she died and David after the fact between Gardaí interviews and court statements. Jean grew up in a South Dublin suburb of Terranur, an affluent middle class area of Dublin. Her family described her as a passionate, bubbly, joyous person who could turn her hand to anything. She was very independent and kind. Her brother would state that when they were children and went on holidays, she would always get the prize from her parents for being the best behaved. Jean would go to work at the age of 17 as a lab technician and got a third level education in food science. This was in the 1980s during a pretty bad recession where many people had to leave Ireland and so she was quite lucky to have a good steady job. She was also credited to developing the first gummy bear without any artificial colours or flavours. So she was doing well for herself, even buying her own home. She lived by the principles of the Buddhists, of peace and love. Although shy and private, she had a great sense of humour. Before buying her house in Laverna Dale in Castleknock in Dublin, Jean went on a Buddhist retreat to Tokyo in her 20s in 1986. And here she would meet a fellow Buddhist, Robert Campion, or Bob as he would be referred to later on. He was an English half Italian musician and they fell madly in love. The romance would last a year and a half. Jean would visit him in England and Bob would take the trip to Ireland. But this relationship was not to last. In 1988, Jean wrote to Bob and asked him to marry her. And Bob unfortunately would say no. He was not ready to commit to marriage as he was trying to further his career in music, which in later years he would live to regret. After the refusal, the relationship broke down and it was no more. Jean moved on in the early 90s. She would meet David Burke. David was from Mullingar, County Westmeath. He came from a middle class family and was well educated and gave the impression of an all round nice guy. He moved to Dublin in 1993 and his relationship blossomed with Jean. He worked in insurance with Hibernian. He was a moderate earner in comparison to Jean, but this did not affect their relationship. He moved into Jean's house and eventually they got married in 1995. They went on to have three children and each birth was quite difficult for Jean and she was struggling to maintain the high profile job. So when she was made redundant after her first child, it was a blessing in disguise. But this would change the dynamics in the household. David was the sole earner and he was very controlling of the purse strings, among other things as Jean would soon discover. So really from the beginning of their marriage, there was problems. But because Jean was a very private person, she told no one. David would say later that he thought his marriage was a good one, an ordinary marriage. They did normal things and activities, went on holidays every year, mostly to France. But before Jean died, her family and friends saw a change in Jean in the autumn of 2006. She had lost a lot of weight and didn't seem herself. One of her friends confronted her and asked what was going on. Jean cracked and told her everything. It just all poured out of her, that things were not okay. David was controlling, very critical of her and the children. He had no friends, stayed in watching TV all the time and their intimate life was unspeakable. This she did not elaborate on, so I don't have the details of what that entailed. Jean felt extremely under pressure and she was not in love with David anymore. Her friend was completely in shock over all Jean was saying as they had given off such a good impression to everyone around them that this was a really good marriage. David controlled his wife, his children and most of all the money. The person controlling the money, as many of you may know, controls the household and those who live in it. This must have been very hard on Jean coming from a place where she once had independence a well-paid job and a house she had bought on her own merit. 
In 2007, and feeling totally trapped and unhappy, Jean's old flame, Bob, would reach out to her. Bob heard that she had got married and had three children and wanted to know how she was. Jean, being totally unhappy in her marriage, was delighted to hear from Bob and it rekindled something in her. He said he contacted her to test the waters as he always regretted not marrying her. She replied to him and they realised there was still something between them. They started communicating through letters, emails and phone calls. Jean would later say she never would have done this if she had been happy in her marriage. These were very passionate letters and emails and even before they met up she had suggested that she sell her engagement ring and another ring David had given her so they could fund a trip to Japan where they first met all those years ago. Bob spoke how if they were to be together it would have to be dealt with in a delicate way as there was children involved. In the letters Jean told Bob that she wanted them to lead long healthy lives together. She said she wanted them to be together as long as possible in this lifetime. With renewed strength from the rekindled relationship with Bob, Jean knew she had to put an end to her miserable marriage with David, her husband. Even though she was in a vulnerable state after years of being in a marriage that was unhappy and abusive, rather than sneaking around behind David's back, she decided to tell David of Bob and asked for a separation before she met up with him. She knew once this happened, it would lead to a physical relationship. But we all know that an affair doesn't mean physical only. In fact, an emotional affair is worse. On June 15, 2007, Jean asked David to meet her in a pub and she broke the news to him that she wanted a separation, that she didn't love him anymore. In fact, she never did and that she was in love with someone else. I guess Jean didn't get Bob the one true love the first time round. Rejected by him, the alpha male, and so settled for the beta, David. But now she had a second chance with him. She had the alpha back in her life and she wasn't going to miss out. I guess we all have one person in our lives that we are either lucky to end up with or for others end up as alpha widows, married to someone we settle for. It's not a very nice situation to be in. Anyway, back to the case. Having the support of Bob, it gave Jean the courage to break away from David and his abusive ways. To David, this was totally out of the blue. He was one that couldn't see the wood for the trees and was totally blindsided. This is what he would say in his statements to the Gardaí. But I wonder are abusers aware of their behaviour or is it so natural to them? We now have many forms and labels on the different degrees of abuse. And I wonder, is there awareness or do they think they are doing everything for the good of the family, but not see how the people within the family are totally miserable? These are questions I often ask myself when I do these cases. After the meeting, Jean told her friend that she purposely met David in a public place to tell him so there would be no knives around. This shocked her friend and she questioned Jean what she meant, but Jean brushed it off. So there was definitely an element of fear in Jean and the family did say there was an incident years ago, but they wouldn't go into what happened out of respect for their three children. Jean and David began living separate lives under the one roof after she broke the news to him. David stayed in the master bedroom and Jean moved to the box room. She told David she wanted him out of the house in a month, but I read that through mediation they decided that Jean alone would move out of the house and David would take the children. I don't know how true this is. I couldn't imagine Jean agreeing to giving up her children and her house. Four days after Jean broke the news to David, he went around to her parents' house to express his devastation and ask for advice on what to do. The family contacted Jean and they met up the next day and she started by saying, I'm going to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. She told her family that she would never have entertained Bob if David had been a better man. It was the first time she had told her family of the miserable life she had with David. After Jean was so truthful to David about her feelings towards him or lack of and telling him about Bob, this was not good enough for David. He needed proof and details of what was going on under his nose. So he started to turn the house upside down looking for anything about Jean and Bob. And unfortunately, he would find their emails and letters to each other. They were full of intimate details of their feelings, plans for the future and how they were so in love. 
He also read how Jean was going to sell her rings to fund this trip to Japan. This was absolutely devastating to David and he couldn't cope, but also it brought out a more sinister side to him. He photocopied and downloaded all the correspondence and kept them in a safe in his sister's shop. All this new information sent David into a downward spiral. He went into a really dark place in his head. Neighbours would say they would see David wandering in and out of the local park. He took time off work and when he was in work he appeared to be a shell of a man. He was very stressed and saw a counsellor and it would come out later that he became very close to a female co-worker. David would say he felt very passionate about this woman and they once had dinner together but never anything physical. The man that saw himself as all powerful and controlling was now becoming someone he never wanted to be. Finally, he realised that he had lost any hold he had over Jean and even worse, he had lost her to another man, her first true love. He knew he couldn't compete with that. So through his anger and devastation, he made Jean's life a living hell while he still could. He was to move out in July, but made no moves on doing so. And things were getting more and more difficult for Jean having David living there. It is known that David never took any responsibility for the breakdown of the marriage. He had no hand in it. It was all Jean's fault. In July 2007, Jean felt she needed to get away, clear her head and of course see Bob also. She flew to France to a Buddhist retreat and flew home to Dublin after three days. When she got back to Dublin, she took a flight to Southampton, which is 70 miles outside London on the southwest coast of England. This trip was their big reunion, as they had not seen each other in nearly 20 years. A month after Jean returned from Southampton to Dublin, she returned again and this time it would be a 10 day visit. They decided on a new life in Ireland. Bob gave up his job, the let on his flat and Jean bought him a car. They left Southampton on the 26th of August 2007, heading to Ireland to begin their new life together. But Jean's second trip to Southampton pushed David beyond the brink. His life was falling apart while Jean's was coming together and this drove David crazy. David's psychotherapist was so worried about him that she gave him the number of the Samaritans. He was on antidepressants and sleeping tablets. When Jean and Bob arrived in Dublin, Bob stayed in a hotel near Jean's home. While David was in Mullingar visiting his parents and collecting his children, Jean decided it was a good idea to have Bob over for dinner at the house on the same day they arrived in Dublin. She sent David a text saying there was no rush back, that she wouldn't be there as she was staying with a friend that night. After dinner, Jean and Bob went back to the hotel and when David arrived home with the children, there was two dirty plates in the sink, two wine glasses, a smell of cigarettes and body odour. This sent David ballistic. Not that I'd blame him, it was the marital home and you don't bring your new beau there. But I can see Jean's point also. It was now the end of August and David still hadn't moved out. He was making her life a living hell and I guess maybe in her mind with the support of Bob, she saw it as a way to give him the final push to get him out. David would say later in a statement that he felt like a cuckold for the first time after coming home to another man being in his house. A cuckold is an old fashioned term for a man whose wife is unfaithful with another person. This term I have never heard before. You learn something new every day. Jean spent that Sunday night on the 26th of August 2007 with Bob in the hotel and the next morning she returned home on the Monday. David's anger had intensified since the day before. When Jean walked into the house, David started on Jean straight away and they had a massive argument. David ended up storming out of the house and went to Hoth to clear his head. And later on, he texted his female co-worker to say he had to leave the house as he would have killed her as he was so angry. When David returned to the house that evening, Jean said she was going to visit her mother. It is uncertain if she did, but she did meet up with Bob. They had a few drinks in the hotel Jean returned home around 11 p.m. and another row ensued. As Davis said, he had plans and Jean never came home until late and so he was left minding the children. So again, this added fuel to the fire of David's rage. 
They eventually went to bed that night, as per usual, in separate rooms. The next morning, Tuesday, the 28th of August, at around 5.30 a.m., Jean got up to leave the house and David heard her. He got up and looked out the window and saw Jean leaving in her car. To him, Jean was going to see Bob and this left him fuming, so much so he could not get back to sleep. Jean sent him a text message saying, I'm gone to get a message. He replied, what message can you do at this hour? David was very jealous, angry and losing control at this point. He got up and had breakfast, went back to bed again and played with the children. Jean returned at around 10 a.m. The children were up and the cartoons were on the TV in the living room where the children were playing. David went for a shower and he would later say this is where he first contemplated getting a knife as the rage was boiling in him at this point. He said that Jean came across as smug, happy and self-satisfied and this was enraging him. When he got out of the shower, he went to the kitchen and Jean was in the living room with the children. His oldest child asked him for some toast and after making it for her, David took a knife and put it in his back pocket and approached Jean in the sitting room where she was sitting with her two children. He started on her straight away by accusing her of giving their son's phone to her new boyfriend as it was missing. Jean would deny this, but unknown to Jean, it was not about a phone. David wanted to hurt Jean as she had hurt him. David lunged at Jean and started to stab her. Jean fell on the floor and David continued. Jean fought for her life as would be shown in the autopsy results. She was stabbed four times in the back while her children cowered together in the same room. This must have been absolutely terrifying for those poor children. The oldest child, who was 10 at the time, came into the room and saw what was happening and said to her father, Why did you kill her? What is going to happen to us now? David eventually stopped stabbing Jean and it was over as quickly as it started. Jean lay unconscious on the floor and the little girl started to do mouth to mouth on her mother while David rang the guardie and told them what had happened. He hung up the phone as he was too upset to talk. He put a pillow under Jean's head while his daughter continued to try and save her mother. A psychologist would later say that in his opinion when asked why David would do this in front of his children, he would say it may have been to show the children what a bad person their mother was and this is what happens to bad people or it may be that David was so self-involved in his own rage and jealousy that he just didn't care. Either way, it was the most heinous act. When the ambulance arrived, the three children were still in the living room and Jean was unconscious on the floor. Jean was rushed to Conley Hospital in Blanchardstown in Dublin, but would later die from her injuries. When Gardy arrived at the house, they initially arrested David for assault. He was very calm and not displaying much emotion. The Gardy recovered the knife that was used, which was sitting on the mantelpiece where he had left it. When David was brought to Blanchestown Guard Station for interview, he broke down and said he never meant to kill Jean. He wanted her to experience the pain and suffering he himself had experienced. He said he hated his wife, but that hate is a funny thing because he still loved her. When asked when he first thought about doing what he did, he said it was when he was in the shower and then when he was watching TV. He kept insisting he didn't want to kill her, but just to cause her pain. Yeah, right. While he was being interviewed, David also told Gardy about the letters he had found in June. He said, I found her letters. She was going to leave me. That's why I killed her. Meanwhile, Jean's boyfriend, Bob, was unable to get through to her and was growing concerned. So eventually he went around to the house. On arrival, Bob realised something awful must have happened and was devastated when he learned that Jean was dead. After Jean passed away, David was re-arrested at the Garda station on suspicion of murder. David had nothing to say. On the 23rd of March 2009, David stood trial for Jean's murder and pleaded not guilty. During the trial, evidence was given by two of the young children who witnessed their mother's death at the hands of their father. But what was most striking feature of the trial was David's own testimony. He cried for so much of it. He described how emotionally destroyed he was when he found out his marriage was over in June. He came across as a quite an emotional, caring and loving man 
who loved his family and wife, and there was a mixed reaction in the court. But with all his blah, blah, blah emotional dribble, it didn't take away the fact that he had stabbed his wife to death in front of his children. Of course, what usually comes with this type of murder, the defence used the usual smear campaign on poor Jean. David's team made out she was an adulterer, that she had numerous affairs behind his back and that he was provoked into doing what he did and that it wasn't guilty of murder. The defence presented the family as a happy one until Bob came along. They described Bob as a predator, somebody that was classless, half Italian, an ageing gigolo who was just using Jean for her money. They never went into the real aspect of the 10 year marriage and how much Jean had suffered in it. The family afterwards were very upset by this and upset that her reputation was absolutely sold. Bob, after Jean died, was left absolutely devastated and alone in Ireland. All his plans with Jean were now gone and he returned to England. When the trial began, he was just too upset and broken to go back and give evidence. His neighbours would say that the death of Jean had a terrible effect on him. He was a shadow of his former self. He said he didn't like how he was portrayed by the defence, that it was a cheap shot at him. He loved Jean and she was his priority and he rejected any of what the defence said about him. On the 30th of March 2009, the jury retired to consider their verdict. It would take eight hours and they came back with the majority verdict of 11 to 1 and found David guilty of murder and sentenced him to life in prison. David was completely in shock. He was muttering to himself, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. He clearly thought he would be found guilty of manslaughter and that his manipulation had worked on the jury. In December 2012, David launched an appeal against his murder conviction. This appeal was dismissed in January 2013 and David was brought back to Wheatfield Prison where he is to this day. It is said that David was a controlling and manipulative person while coming across as a weak and submissive man. This is how maybe he hid who he really was underneath. Jean was definitely the more kinder, the more outgoing of the two of them, and she paid a high price for her happiness, as did her children. They had been raised by Jean's family. Finally, for once, the children went to the victim's family, unlike some of my other cases. There is nothing known about the children other than that, and I think that is the way it should be. I give them nothing but love. They have suffered a terrible ordeal, one that they will never forget.